Boogie. I'm sitting here with Mastermind, amazing producer, and then some Prince Paul. How you doing today, huh? I'm good. You, you uh, got late. You know, all, all the nice things you said. I, I, I've been tardy. I, I should have done this like a while ago, and, and I apologize. Um, why don't you introduce yourself, even though almost everybody watching knows who you are. Why don't you introduce who you are and what hip-hop means to you? I'll start you off with a really tough question. Okay. Well, my name is Prince Paul. I am a DJ, producer, I was in a group Stetsasonic, I produced De La Soul, uh, I was in a group The Gravediggers, I was part of a group called Handsome Boy Marlin School, uh, man the list goes on, I could keep going on, but that's the, the, the gist of what I do. And, and let me see, in hip hop, uh, means to me, um, I don't know, it, it, it if you would have asked me when I was a kid, it would probably been one thing. If you ask me now, it's probably, I don't know. <laughs> I stone I'll, Prince Paul. I'll, I'll appear to be tainted. Like, uh, if you asked me when I was a kid, hip-hop was fun and adventurous, and and it's a big question mark. He didn't know stuff. Now it's, now it, it's uh, to me, for 2011, hip-hop is commercial. <laughs> And that's just being honest. It's like you know, it, it's not, it's not that underground like thing you had to go and go in the gutter to find and kind of peek behind corners and your parents hated. And, and now it's like you flip your laptop on, you read a book, it's there. So it's 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 commercial. How how were you introduced to the hip hop world? But you know, once upon a time. Honestly, I really don't remember. But I started DJing when I was between ten and eleven. I would literally sit in front of the DJ. I remember, once I, I found out, I remember riding my bike and just looking at, at the DJ like this. <laughs> the whole night looking at his records, looking at all stuff, and a lot different than it is now, but it was, it was, it was insane. First record I remember hearing, hip hop related, like back in those days, disco records was hip hop too. So it was either Sarone's Look for Love was a break beat. It might've been um, Apache. It might have been Karen Young's Hot Shot, or it might have been, I remember them playing Cameos, It's Serious, on, it was a 45. So there, there was a bunch of them, like, but I, I don't remember. Come to think of it, my first hip hop experience might have been a tape. It might have been, it might have been probably maybe Flash, or it might have been Africa Bambata. That's a tough one. Like, there, there was so many things back then. How does it feel to be like a pioneer in this sound, in this genre of hip hop? Because there's different genres of hip hop. Right. I mean, you have like the beginning, like the beginning, Cold Crush, Bambada, you know, Flash, all of them. Right. Then you have Run DMC into, you know, the 80s and whatnot. And then you have Tribe, De La, Far Side, this kind of more free spirited, hippie hip hop, if you want to label it. Jazz influence, you know, funk, bass, all of that stuff. I mean, that sound was you. You helped create that sound. I mean, you have to take credit for that. <laughs> How do, do you see it that way, or do you just see it as something that just was inside you that came out at the right time with the right people? The natural transition was to become DJ producer, and so being a DJ, you collect records and you try to get records that nobody else has. Right. And so in that process of a col of collecting records as a DJ you do the same as a producer, so you kind of stumble on sounds and ideas by accident. And so looking back, I'm just thankful. I'm just thankful I still have a job and I'm still relevant. It's, it's not until people come and tell me that I've achieved certain things is then I realize it. Like I don't like mark down, ah, October 1st, 1990, I've created the, the, it's like, for example, I remember Hank Shockley came up to me and he was like, you know, if it wasn't for you, fat beats wouldn't exist. You created all the backpack. The backpacker started with you, the backpacker generation. I'm like, really? I never thought of that. Do you 
how do you collaborate with the members of DeLa and create DeLa and do what you did? I mean, was you're all from Strong Island, right? Right. All yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah. did you all grow up together like Tribe did and, you know, you kind of hung out and just created the sound or was there an, an actual story to it? Well, we all went to the same school. Uh -huh. uh, we all went to Amityville High School. We were all in age order. Um, to give an example, Maceo would be in ninth. Pass would be in 10th, True Goy Dave would be in 11th, and I would be in 12th. What gave me the edge was I was in Stetsasonic, which I was the guy in the neighborhood. Yo, he made a record. I mean, there was other dudes who made records, kind of real small independent things, but, you know, I was the guy who made a record that got played on the radio. So How old were you? I was mm, 17 when, when, when uh, Maceo more or less had everything rolling because we were working with our, um, our high school music teacher. He actually played the drums for Isley Brothers. So then he was our music teacher, and, and he put together a, a band, uh, I'm sorry, a label, and he was putting out this guy named Gangster B. And when he, uh, he asked me to, to make a beat for him, and the, the beat that he wanted wasn't what I would have done, but under his direction, and me being really young too, I made what he wanted, and me and Mace was just like, oh, this is corny. Oh, God, that's what me. You remember the beat? What was the beat? Yeah, the beat was like this. I could tell you the drum machine. It was called a sequential tom. And what was cool about that drum machine is it came with these cartridges with different sounds. I still have it. And you could play beats backwards. So he told me he had a group named De La Soul. He uh, said, I'll bring the guys by later. I'll give you a tape. And it was a rough of plug tuning. And I listened to it. I was like, yo, I've never heard anything like this before. I was like, yo, come back tomorrow, and I'm going to take this tape, and I'm going to flip it. So, you know, old school, we take two, take two cassette decks and overdub and... Was, you know, so I took and added stuff to it and let them hear it. And they were like, oh, wow, wow this is crazy. I was like, yo, we should really get together and record this, like, for real. We're just having fun, right? I mean, you didn't really know what this was going to become and build into, right? No, nah, I mean, that's the beauty of, I think, at least hip-hop in, in that during that time is was you're just having fun. And, and, and you try to create and you try to be competitive, too. You, you know, you want to be better than the next person. But, uh, yeah, we just stumbled onto things. Like... My, my approach to production, and it still is today, it doesn't hurt to try. Because there's always the, the erase button. Day Law is associated with those groups that I mentioned, like um, like Tribe Called Quest, yeah. Jungle Brothers, you know, exactly, yeah. exactly. So was that just just knowing each other in that community, or was there an actual, you know, oh, you guys should meet, you know, Fife and Tiff and <laughs> Shahid and all the... You, you know how they always say you attract what you are, mm -hmm. and I think it, that hip-hop community back then at least the more up-and-coming was a little close-knit so you're you're bound to be come across the people who you're similar to and for them you know my realm is was more or less that's a sonic and that was just like the public enemies and all you know going to that rap that realm the krs ones and stuff they were with the up-and-comings and so you know it's like wow you make music i make music too and, and they kind of just kind of i think they met the jungle brothers first and then through Jungle Brothers was Tip, and then through that it just kept going on and on and on. Working with Tip and working with De La and a lot of those guys, they, I was the guy who answered the questions. Like, how do we do whatever? What do you, you know? Oh, yeah. And it's nice to see everybody kind of go and kind of do, you know, the other thing. But I don't sit and take credit and go, hey, you know, when we caught Three Feet High Rise and Tip asked me, Paul, how should I loop? <laughs> I don't do that. That's uh, my influence would be. Parliament Funkadelic, George Clinton, Bernie Warrell, all those guys. Uh, as far as being creative and kind of going left field, combine that with Africa Bambata. Because Bambata's collection, to me, in early hip-hop, he had records to this day, I have no idea what it is. Even with the, with the help of the internet, <laughs> I have no idea what some of those records are. You know, he was kind of like the pioneer of that, probably skill-wise, Looked up to Theodore and Jazzy J, which Jazzy J doesn't get enough credit. DST was nice back then, and Flash, and then probably in that order. I think the first record I ever bought as a child, I was probably like five or six years old. My mom gave me a dollar, and I went to May. It's called May's Department Store. They had it in New York. It doesn't exist anymore. And I bought Hot Pants wow. and Groove Me by King Floyd was my first two records I ever bought. Every black kid back in those days listened to James Brown. Your family grew up on it. Um, Gil Scott Heron, uh, I mean, 
you know, growing up, especially in the young days, knowing, you know, in the bottle and all those other like songs and being a poet and an activist and, you know, like Guru, I've known him for quite some time and he's been by my house, he's recorded, we've chatted on the phone at times, you know. Um, yeah, it's funny, I, I got pictures of me and him when he's at my house recording. All those people at some point had been in my life in some form or fashion and, you know, at least inspired me in, in, in some way, you know. Um, I produced uh, Three Feet High Rise and De La Soul's Dead and Balloon My State. We started to record Stakes Is High together, but then it was a, it was a kind of a time of tension because De La was in, in a situation where the, the records were decreasing in sales and popularity. And so I'm still in like junior high, high school, yo, let's just have fun and experiment. And they were like, yo, if this album doesn't work out, it's gonna be over for us. I said, hey, look, you know, maybe it's better if you guys kind of handle this on your own. We started recording like the first part of it at my house and they were like, cool. They had uh, Dylan and a few other people um, work on that record, but during the course of recording, I would go over Pasta's house, we'd play, oh, what do you think of this song? What do you think? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? I'm like, oh, that's great. That's, you should do blah, blah, blah. So I was still cool and still kind of like involved, but not on in a way that, you know, was hands on as the previous albums. When you work, and especially when you're really passionate about your music, and when your music and passion affects your, your daily life, your family and your money and everything, it gets a little sensitive. And there's got to be a point where you know, where you should separate it and realize that your friendship is more important. And it's funny because people always, they, they come like, yo, they, they was always waiting for the crazy breakup story. Why don't you work with Dayla anymore? Yo, what happened? The fight? And I was like, nah, I just decided to blah, blah, blah. And they're like, that's it? That's why to this day, there's never been a story to surface that everybody wanted because it happened out of like being cool. And that's, and that's why we still to this day work together, hang out. You know, we still work together, still do things, but it, it was a weird point, man. And I could feel it. You could feel the tension. You know, it was like, uh-oh, something's going to go down. Because, like, no, I think that hi-hat needs to be. And we never talked that aggressively to each other. And it's to the point where I had to sit back and, like, you know, it might be better if we... <laughs> well, the irony is that the stakes were high, literally. <laughs> and, that, and hence, honestly, that's why the album's called Stakes is High. This, it was based on that. The first three records, especially the first one, was more of my personality. And they were getting older, and they wanted to do more of what they felt they were growing into. And I had to respect that. And I... And I disagreed at the time. I was like, no, it was all of us. But then I thought about it. I provoked a lot of the silly stuff and the things that we were doing. I'm like, all right, yeah, okay. Now, we, now we just got a like, confession on tape, yeah. by the way. One thing is I'm working on this project with Scion, which is uh, kind of like a documentary type of thing where I travel around the country and I try to be inspired by different types of music. So I go to like a rock fest, trying to find music to make me excited. And, and it's more or less tracking that. Last question. Yeah. And this is what all the boys and girls at home want to know. Are you and Dela ever going to combine yeah. again and do something soon? <laughs> um, probably. No, and, and, and I would say for these few reasons. One is I remember about in 99, probably when I did Prince Among Thieves, I, I, was, like, I was like, I was real hot on wanting to do another record. It's like, let's do an album together. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay. And I think to make a record now, it wouldn't be as fun as it was back then. Because back then we just did things because we were stupid and we just did things to do it. So, you've been watching El Boogie's Video Journal with Prince Paul here as my guest. Hopefully we'll meet again sometime soon. It won't take six months to organize. Yes, yes. I, I, I will be better at organizing things and I apologize. It's not that I'm not fly, it's just that my, my schedule is, 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 is weird and I apologize. It's just weird, yeah. but we're not. Yeah, yeah, it's very normal. So, peace out, thanks for watching. Mirror, mirror on the wall, tell me mirror what is wrong? Can it be my daylight clothes or is it just my daylight song? How you doing? This is Prince Paul and you're checking out El Boogie's Hip Hop Journal. I don't know if that's the title of it, but that's what I'll call it. I'm glad to be here. It took me forever to get this done. Thank you for inviting me. It's just me, myself and I.